Okay, we are here on WPPM 106.5 in Philadelphia with Larry Eichel, the Senior Advisor and Philadelphia Research and Policy Initiative at the Pew Charitable Trusts. Uh, Mr. Eichel, thank you so much for being with us. Great to be with you. Um, so Pew put out a, a very important article, very interesting article last week about the state uniformity clause and what that, how that impacts Philadelphia. Can you tell us a little bit about what the uniformity clause is? Yeah, I mean, the uniformity clause is, is a very short, simple part of the state constitution that was ad adopted in 1874. And it says, um, it's got a little bit other language, but the operative part is all taxes shall be uniform upon the same class of subjects. Um, and lots of uh, states have language like this in their constitution. The federal government actually has a uses the word uniform, for federal constitution uses the un word uniformity as well. Um, but what's different about Pennsylvania is the way it's been interpreted uh, by the state courts. Um, in most states, it, it seems to mean simply, uh, you know, if, uh, if you and I have two pieces of property next to each other that are identical, they should be taxed the same. Um, in Pennsylvania's case, what, what the justices have interpreted as meaning is that every type of, of asset, every type, every category of income should be taxed the same. That is, all income shall be taxed at the same rate. All pieces of property should be taxed at the same rate. Uh, like I say, other states have not agreed with this, this interpretation. As a result of that, for instance, we have a flat income tax in the state and a flat wage tax in Philadelphia that applies the same rate to everyone. And we have only one category of property. All property is taxed at the same rate. Again, in other places, that's not true. They have different rates for different types of property. So. Um, 47 states, I think it is, have, have uniformity clauses of, of some kind, and only three of them have interpreted it along the lines that Pennsylvania has. And, and some of the, the examples you provide in the article, an office building worth $50 million has the same 1.3998% property tax rate as a home worth $50,000. Residents making $100 an hour have the same 3.8398% wage tax rate as those making $7.25 minimum wage. And the flat rate on the wage tax as well as the 3.07% state income tax helps give Philadelphia one of the nation's highest state and local burdens on low income households, according to a study uh, that was conducted by the District of Columbia. So how... Does this impact city tax revenues? Well, I mean, it, it, you know, obviously the city can impose any rates that it wants on uh, within, uh, I think any rate, any, any rates on property or on wages. Um, but um, it, it can't, because it can't graduate the taxes, you know, policymakers are very aware that if they raise the rate on property, uh, it's raising the rate on the person who owns that $50,000 house uh, in the same way it is on the office building. You know, you can't target tax increases in any way. You can't, because you can't change the rate. You, you can't vary the rate. Um, so it really limits the options of policymakers. Um, uh, they can't target uh, it, it's very hard for them to target even tax breaks uh, for, the, for the same reason. Um, so um, as I say, it's not so much that it limits their ability to raise revenue, but it, but it limits the, the way to, their ability to raise revenue in a way that they see as being fair to everyone. Uh, and obviously for those reasons that they're reluctant to raise the rates. Um, in, in the District of Columbia, for instance, on property, um, they have six different rates 
on six different categories of, of property, uh, including three different rates on business, depending on the size of business, uh, a different tax rate on, on vacant property, uh, a different on blighted property, and then one on residential property. You know, Philadelphia can't do that. Uh, so when you're talking about not just about raising running money, but if but if you're concerned about equity and, and trying to make a more equitable more equitable tax structure, to to a large degree the hands of of uh, Philadelphia are tied. Now there are a lot of exceptions to the university cla uniformity clause, which I'm sure we'll want to talk about, that are authorized by the legislature. But beyond those, you know, there's not much the city can do. Well, let's talk about that for a second, because when you look at things like the tax debatement, homestead exemption, um, loop program, how are those programs able to exist with the uniformity clause? Well, in 1968, the, the, this, the state of Pennsylvania adopted a, uh, a, what's now called Section 2 of Article 8, which is where the uniformity language is. And it, um, it authorized the legislature to, to grant themselves, grant the state and, loca and lo local municipalities the power to adopt a number of programs that do only for specific purposes that would um, uh, sort of uh, uh, in some ways are workarounds to the uniformity clause. Um, and for instance, uh, the, the homestead exemption, which is one that's very, very well known. Uh, which, which exempts uh, at the moment $45,000 evaluation for all owner-occupied homes. That's, that's specifically authorized in, in the Constitution. Uh, the uh, lower, the long-time owner-occupancy pro occupancy program, which is, uh, is seen widely as sort of a, a reaction to gentrification, uh, it is allowed because that section two of, a, of Article Eight of the Constitution allows relief for homeowners in areas where real property values have risen markedly. Um, the, the tax abatement, the, the uh, tax abatement, which was a ten-year tax abatement did, uh, for uh, for a long time and has been revised uh, to be sl somewhat less valuable uh, starting this year, uh, is allowed because this, that part of the Constitution says. You can have bait abatements to encourage improvement of deteriorating property or areas. And so the abatement is allowed under that. And in fact, we have a, a, a uh, in, in Philadelphia, a, a rather little known and little utilized wage tax credit uh, for low income individuals uh, that, that is also uh, authorized by specific language in, in that part of the constitution. Um, you can and essentially, again, this is just the way these, these things have developed over time. Uh, the court has said you can't have a lower rate for low income people, but you can have a cre tax credit for them um, under certain circumstances. So, uh, uh, you know, it, it, people can apply for a rebate. Uh, on, on the partial rebate on the wage tax. It's not a huge amount of money. Um, it's a, a rather cumbersome process. It sort of piggybacks off uh, a similar program uh, credit for the state income tax, um, but it's there. But to, to get it, you got to know about it and, and you got to fill out the, the paperwork, like I say, which is uh, can be a pain. Um, but it's there. So, I mean, there are specific exceptions to, to uniformity. But when you get to the question of, of rates, the line has been drawn pretty clearly by the courts that there can only be one rate on a wage or income tax, only and only one rate on a property tax, and, and no, no categories of property allowing different rates. Hmm. I'd like to bring Denise Clay Murray here on WPPM 106.5. Thank you. And, and thank you, Mr. Eichel, for giving us some of your time today. Um, are there any plans to try and 
kind of change the dynamics here? Because if you are, you know, charging poor people, especially in the poorest big city in the nation, the same tax rates as you do higher income people, that's going to affect folks differently. And, and there's no uniformity in that. Right. Um, you know, there is, um, no, as far as I know, there, there, there is no effort to sort of change the clause in a, in a sweeping way. Um, about a decade ago, uh, the State Bar Association put together a group uh, to revise the Constitution, to consider constitutional revisions. And they specifically called for a, a constitutional amendment that would make it clear that the uniformity clause allows for graduated tax rates and allows for different classes of property. And that recommendation was published and that was that, nothing, nothing ever happened to it. Um, there was an effort several years ago um, sort of uh, backed by uh, Paul Levy, the president of the Center City District, and Jerry Sweeney from Brand Brandywine Realty Trust to try to, um, to get a, 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 an amendment to the Constitution that would have a very limited one that would have applied only to, this, only to Philadelphia and would, would allow the city um, to uh, create a separate higher tax rate for commercial property. Um, but, and the idea was that the money would be used to reduce wage and business taxes. Um, but that amendment uh, eventually uh, didn't get through the legislature. A lot of people in the city, including uh, the city council president uh, objected to it. Um, but even that was not about setting different tax rates. It was about, it was about setting different tax rates for different kinds of property, but not for different individuals. It was designed, however, as a way to lower the wage tax for everyone. Um, but there has been no movement at all toward any kind of graduated rate on, on the wage tax. Now, you said that part of the reason why the taxes is the taxes um, used the way that it is is because of how it's interpreted. Um, so, is why is it interpreted this way? Has anyone you know ever talked to you about that? Well, it's really hard to tell. I mean, because because I mean, I mean, we're talking about over a hundred years of court precedents, um, mm -hmm. and and w when this language was adopted in 1874. Uh, neither the city nor the state had an income tax. Um, so, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard to figure exactly the, the, the way this is developed. Um, but, you know, when, when you have court precedents over, over a century, um, they're hard to overturn. I mean, there are, only, there are only two ways to overturn it. One is through a constitutional amendment. Um, and the other would be bringing a case to the court and for the court to say, uh, you know, we want to change the way it's been interpreted. Uh, both of those are very difficult kind of long shots. Uh, and I don't know of any case that is moving, I don't know of any test case that is moving forward. Um, and um, the, um, there's, there's no move to have a constitutional amendment too. I mean, part of it is, is you know, the idea of tax uniformity, when you say it, I mean, that sounds like a good idea. Um, you know, everybody should be treated fairly under the tax system. And uh, uh, a lot of, most of the litigation surrounding the uniformity clause has been about property taxes and, and, and property assessments. and you know, there are, there are lots of attorneys and others who, who would say, well, you know, the uniformity clause is really important because, you know, if, if so-and-so, if somebody's, uh, 
house gets assessed for $200,000 more than somebody else's house. You know, the uniformity clause allows them to go in and say, hey, by the uniformity, you know, we're not being treated uniformly. Um, so a lot, a lot of, you know, there, there's a lot of support for it in that, in that regard. Uh, I think it's, and as far as on, on, the, on the wage tax um, and income taxes, it, it, it's both the case, it would have both be, have to be a case of an amendment allowing there to be graduated taxes. And then the legislator or city council willing to adopt uh, graduated taxes. So it's, it's, it's a very complicated uh, uh, situation and very hard to change. Now, the city has been trying to get rid of the wage tax. You hear a lot of talk in council about getting rid of the wage tax, phasing it out, or not relying so heavily on it. Because one of the things that they noticed during the pandemic is our over-reliance on the wage tax really impacted our budget. Um, could, you know, would, would another, I, I guess the, the question I, I want to ask is, the, under the uniformity clause, you know, everybody has to be you know, taxed the same way. And, and tax at the same rate. If you get rid of a if you get rid of a tax like the wage tax, is that impacted by that? No, not at all. I mean, there's 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 nothing in the uniformity clause that would prevent the city from getting rid of the wage tax. I mean, obviously, what would, what discourages the city from getting rid of the wage tax is the question of, you know, where do you get the where do you get the revenue to, to replace the, uh, you know, it's it's it the, the wage tax is a about half of the of the city's locally generated taxes. It's a, it's a huge amount of money, and you know, you know, where do where do you replace that? I mean, there have been talk by tax commissions in the past and others about gradually sort of shifting um, the wage tax, the money raised wage raised by the wage tax to the property tax, um, and you know that's not a very popular idea either. Um, especially uh, when you have the uniformity clause that prevents there from being higher rates for uh, commercial and industrial property. Um, so the uniformity clause figures into it that way, but, but you know, the, the uniformity clause would not prevent the city from doing away with the wage tax or any other tax. Okay, now what do citizens, I guess, how can citizens um, impress upon their lawmakers that there needs to be some wiggle room with the uniformity, cla uniformity clause if that's what they think it, they, they think they need because like I said you have some people who are you know not well off in the poorest big city in America and if the people who are making more and, and getting more are paying less in taxes than they are that's not uniform. How can right. citizens, you know, how can citizens, you know, talk to their lawmakers about this? Is yeah, well, there anything I, that they can do? I'm not sure I would agree with your assertion that that, uh, that pe people with with higher incomes are paying less. Um, I mean, they're 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 paying the same rate. Um, Local, lo I think local officials are very aware of the way. The uniformity clause ties their hands. They would love to see change, um, but I think they feel. I think they feel that there, there is no way for them to ch to change it uh, because um, you know it, it would require, as I said, either a constitutional amendment or um, a, a, a court to go against a half a century of uh, a precedent. Um, uh, you know, it's funny that there are things that the city has done even uh, beyond uh, the, the sort of uh, the specific uh, exceptions that the state constitution now, now, now allows. There are things the city has done uh, to get around the, the, uh, the uniformity clause. One is the use and occupancy tax. Um, 
which is not specifically authorized in, in the state in, in the state constitution, and, and it is a tax on commercial. It's it, it's in essence a property tax on commercial property, although that's not what it's called. It, it's it, it it's been deemed constitutional because it's not a tax on the property; it's on the tax of the use of property, uh, which is you know one of those distinctions that that uh, lawyers like. Um, so that that tax uh, is imposed on commercial property, and the the, the proceeds go to the school district. Um, and another thing that the city has done in uh, in, in trying to revise its uh, its business taxes, the birth tax, um, the city recently moved a number of years ago to uh, exempt the first hundred first two hundred thousand dollars of receipts. That a business has um, from the from from the BERT tax, um, and you know, as I read the uniformity clause, that might not pass muster uh, by a court if anyone were to challenge. No one has challenged it, and uh, I think city officials are hoping no one ever does. Um, but. Uh, you know, those are the kinds of little things that the, the city can do, has done, uh, that, uh, you know, in their view, try to make things more fit. Okay, thank you. And, and Larry, do you have another question? Uh, yeah, the last thing I'd just like to bring up, I, I can't remember exactly where it was, maybe it was Montgomery County, where they tried to do a reassessment, but only on businesses. And that was uh, challenged and uh, was viewed as a violation of the uniformity clause. Um, so even when, you know, uh, counties and, and local governments try to get creative with this, as you said, it, it's still subject to challenge. And it seems like it's, it's very constraining uh, yeah, for local I, governments. Yeah, actually, the case, the case you're talking about is actually a Philadelphia case. It's called... Uh, Duffield House Associates versus the city of Philadelphia. And it's, it's, it's uh, been ruled on by the Commonwealth Court. Um, and, and, it, and the city's appealing it to the state Supreme Court. And essentially what happened was that in, for the 2018 tax year, um, the, uh, uh, basically ever since the coming of the of AVI, the actual value initiative in, in 2014. Uh, the, in that, the idea there was that the city would, would reassess properties regularly, perhaps even annually, uh, which, which it had not done in the past. It, it, it has been unable to do that for a number of reasons, um, including technology and uh, the number of uh, claims, uh, appeals that were filed against the the reassessments in 2014. But one thing they did in 2018 was they, they reassessed all the commercial property, basically claiming that it was very much under, saying it was very much under assessed. Um, and um, the, uh, a lot of the uh, commercial operation, commercial uh, concerns got together and filed a lawsuit uh, and they won at trial, they won on appeal to the Commonwealth Court and it's pending uh, to the state Supreme Court. And, and my understanding is that there's basically about $48 million uh, at stake here that the city might or might not have to refund uh, in, in those higher taxes. Um, I actually, in the course of, uh, of, of doing this report, <clears throat> I asked a lawyer who is very, who's very, has, has tried a lot of uh, cases involving the uniformity clause. Again, most of them involve in property. I said, so if the city of Philadelphia decided, hey, we really would like to reassess every property in the city on an annual basis, but that's just too hard. It's too much work. We can't do it. Um, but we'll do commercial property one year. Um, residential property the next and go on like that every other year doing one or the other. I said, could you make a uniformity clause argument against doing it that way? And he said he thought he could. 
uh, you know, which then kind of sounds ridiculous. Um, but, um, you know, the courts have interpreted uniformity in a very kind of strict way, um, which is not to say that's how they would interpret it in a case like that. But, but, but it was interesting that he thought that he would have an argument that the courts would take as a serious, reasonable argument, um, that, that doing it that way was, was not appropriate. So uh, the uniformity clause has, has a lot of power, um, um, especially in these cases involving property assessments. Um, there's just a tremendous long line of precedent in, in, in that regard. Not so much on the income side, it just hasn't been tried as much because it, those, those rules are, are pretty clear. It's kind of hard to go against them, but the, but the property cases keep coming up and, and the uniformity clause plays, plays a very powerful role in those cases. All right. Well, Mr. Larry Eichel, thank you so much for being with us. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Great to be with you guys.